time to turn your video cameras off. Uh, so next on my list uh, was Agnes, I think. Hello everyone. Yeah, hi, this is my first time here. Um, I work for HMRC um, within Customs Declaration Service and um, Life Services Support as a service manager, um, sorry, delivery manager and scrum master. And I was introduced to this group by Johnny Vozazoala, who has joined us in HMRC um, a few months ago. So yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to be here and uh, yeah, looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Welcome, thank you. Uh, and I've got Sarah. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Sarah Richardson. I work in the Department for Education. I'm completely new to delivery management and at the moment I'm working, we're doing a, a complete transformation and overhaul of our digital um, services within the Department for Education. So um, that's where I'm currently working. You're welcome. Uh, Katya next. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I am Katia Norman Buller. Um, I work alongside Eleanor uh, at the Pensions Regulator based in Brighton, uh, working on the the, the same uh, transformation program. Uh, my role is that of a business change manager, uh, but just really interested to uh, yeah get to know this group and and uh, uh, and the the topics that are going to be discussed today. Welcome. Thank you, um, Martha. Hi everyone, lovely to meet you all and uh, nice to join join the group. Um, I'm Martha and I'm a junior delivery manager in the NHS Digital Policy Unit. Thanks for having me. I think we're getting loads of different departments on today, all new. It's brilliant to hear all these different departments joining. Um, I have Darwin. Hi folks, nice to see you. I'm Darren Pelton, um, co-founder of Pilotworks, I'm a consultant currently working with Government Digital Service. Um, so hello Nick and uh, I've worked with Mark in the past as well. So nice to see Mark again. Um, we just worked together at Department for Education, so that was really great. Um, nice to meet everybody. Welcome and we just have one more, Opayemi. Hi there, um, nice to meet you all. I'm Okbe within the DWP bereavement team and I'm a delivery manager. Um, I'm new in the public sector, so looking to learn a lot more with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Excellent stuff. Right, good to meet all those new new voices. We've got nearly 70 people on here. I can see at least at least eight, if not 10 different departments recognised from the delivery community. So it's great to have everybody on here. Um, I'm not going to mess around any longer. We've got Mark Dalgano come along today um, to give us a talk around service ownership models. So I'm going to turn my camera off, uh, let Mark take over. We are recording, as re as I said, so if people don't wish to be on here, that's fine. Um, Mark, over to you. Great, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's get started. So uh, I'm Mark Delgarno. I'm the Delivery Director of Create Change. Uh, and today's session, uh, it's going to be a bit of a workshop where we explore some different models of service ownership. So. Uh, we'll have failed a bit if I end up doing all the talking. Uh, so, so the idea is we'll be interactive. We'll, we'll get more of it, more out of it, if as many of us participate as possible. But it's okay to sit things out and listen. You know, don't don't feel pressured to to speak in. Um, so yeah, uh, you can reach me on that create change email address. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter while it still exists. Uh, I'm also on Mastodon, but that's a very dormant account. And uh, I write about things like service ownership and digital delivery in the public sector on my Medium account. And uh, I'm very happy to share slides with the organizers after the session. Uh, one very practical note, I've been waiting for some builders to show up uh, for the past couple of weeks and they showed up about 20 minutes ago. So if you hear any banging in the background, that's, uh, that's unfortunately what's happening today. But I didn't really want to turn them away as I've been waiting for them for uh, quite a few weeks now. Uh, I'll probably put my video off while I'm presenting, but I'll keep an eye out in the chat for and for hands up. So, um, who are Create Change? Well, we focus on transformation. Uh, we've got our focus on the public sector. Uh, I've been working in government since 2013, uh, doing a mixture of delivery management, program delivery, agile coaching, 
Uh, I've worked on a lot of discovery and alpha type work as well as private betas, and I've helped set up three digital teams in government at BES, DFE and DCMS, uh, where uh, those departments didn't have a digital team when, when I went in. And prior to 2013, my background's in software, software development. So I was a developer um, and then I did software development management after that. So as I said, it will be a workshop. I'll do a little bit of scene setting. Uh, we'll have a bit of a warm up activity and then we'll look at as many service, different service ownership models as we can in the next kind of 40 minutes or so. Uh, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll aim to leave some time at the end for any final reflections. Uh, do feel free to stick your hand up as we go along or ask questions or put stuff in the chat. And uh, it's okay to stay off camera and on mute if, you just, uh, if you're just happy listening. That's all good and just join in when you feel like it. So a bit of scene setting. So uh, this is taken from the service manual. What is a service owner? It's someone who's accountable for the quality of their service. So you adopt a view across the service, manage your end-to-end -end service, and that could include multiple products and multiple channels. So it could be a digital service. It could have assisted digital. It could include things like letters, uh, it could include a call center. Um, it could include like face-to-face -face, uh, appointments. So that is the service owner. Um, I guess many of us, not everyone, many of us on the call are DDAT specialists. So we work in digital data or technology. And uh, these are some of the key people in digital service delivery. Uh, again, taken from the, the service manual or gov.uk. Um, but there's also a set of other people who are involved in service delivery, and we mustn't forget these people uh, when we're building our digital or technology services. So who else might be involved in service delivery? Well, depending on the, the type of service, um, the, the, the kind of st the stage you're at in the service delivery, uh, it could be one or more of these groups as well. So you might have a live service or a service in beta that needs support. You might be procuring people or services, or buying something to support your service. Um, there might be need for legal questions. You might be hiring people. Uh, you might be in the office, et cetera. So all of these people uh, I kind of consider uh, in the wider set of people who are helping to deliver good, uh, good services for government and for citizens. Uh, just looking at that list there, uh, I've got I've, I kind of include policy in the in the delivery side of things as well. But is there any um, any anyone I've missed from that list? All right. Let's uh, let's just bear that bear that list in mind, really, uh, as well as the DDAP functions and the service owner. Okay, well, um, we'll do something that's a little bit interactive then. So a bit of a warm up. So what we're all trying to do, I guess, in government is think about what a good model or a great model of service ownership is. And uh, somebody asked me just before the call, would we be having an anti-problem today? And uh, I guess I'm, uh, I do these quite a lot in workshops. So people have, people have heard about them. So if our problem is what is a good model of service ownership, an anti-problem might be what would a terrible model of service ownership look like? Uh, thanks, Dan, for the heart in the chat there. So uh, we're just gonna, just gonna take a few minutes. You can think about it or you can put stuff into the chat or you can raise your hand and give answers to the, the problem. What would a terrible model of service ownership look like? Yeah, it's one from Simon there, not making any effort to engage with users. So yeah, maybe just having a, a sole focus on inside government.
yeah, doesn't consider accessibility needs, so it's ex exclusionary in some sense. Uh, Esther, you've mentioned gaps. Can you say? Are you, are you, would you like to say more about that? I'll fill it in later. Okay, when, then. When it's more important, it's not. I'll yeah, I'll get to it. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it's organised around tech, not the users or the customers. Yeah, misaligned roles. Yeah, that's that's a problem on any uh, any ownership model. Yeah, lack of communication with stakeholders. So you know, these are people who are definitely interested in uh, what your service is doing, what outcomes it's achieving, and it can be very easy to get caught up and just head down on delivering the service uh, and forget about those important people who are maybe funding it. Yeah, actively preventing users from contacting you. I've got that with my bank at the moment. <laughs> they, um, they keep emailing me to say, can you get in touch with us? They don't provide a phone number. You can't reply to the email. And if you find a phone number, you're in a one hour queue. Um, yeah, Dan mentions owners not being aware they own things. Uh, multiple people owning different parts of the service and not talking to each other. I, uh, I was in a workshop a few years ago where we were trying to build a roadmap for a service and we'd managed to find different owners of different parts of the end-to-end -end journey and, and some of them didn't know each other. It was, it was quite an eye-opener, really. Yeah, lots of silos. Policy, strategy, delivery teams not working together, firefighting. Yeah, Eleanor mentions doesn't continue to look for opportunities to evolve the service. So the service somehow stays static or goes backwards. These are all great, great stuff. Misaligned roadmaps. Yeah, not knowing the purpose. Of it. This is all good stuff. These are all good ways to uh, do terrible service ownership. So thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for those answers. We'll, we'll move on. Maybe reflect on uh, maybe reflect on some of those as we look at some of the models uh, in the rest of the session. And uh, thanks, Andrew, for the Elon Musk approach. Uh, definitely seems to be counterproductive at Twitter. So we're going to look at uh, as many different models as time allows. Um, I, I'll introduce each model with a bit of a description. And uh, maybe we can have a think about like what might be good about that model or when it might be a good model to use or when it might not be a good model to use. So the, the first one uh, I, I encountered a few departments that are new to digital is where someone is called the service owner, um, but they're not, they're not really like that uh, GDS or service manual definition of service owner. They're, they're more of a contract manager. So a policy team has, um, you know, maybe developed a set of requirements and they've gone and procured a supplier to, to build a system or to build some technology. And um, I, they put a contract in place to make sure that the supplier is, is, is doing a good job of delivering and, and operating that service. So that contract might have things like KPIs in it. Uh, it might have some clauses to allow the service to continue to be evolved, but the service owner is kind of having to manage it through a contract. And I've, uh, I've seen this to be quite a common example, really, as I said, particularly when organizations are new to digital or they don't have an in-house kind of digital or technology delivery capability. So, um, there might be some KPIs, there might be some data that comes out of the service and can be used by the policy team to kind of inform other stuff they're doing. And the contract usually will have a, an end date and it might have ex, uh, clauses for extension of the contract. Uh, has anyone encountered uh, service owners as this uh, in this kind of model?
all right, no, nobody wants to uh, nobody wants to tell me that they've uh, they've encountered this model. Can you can we think of uh, what some of the advantages of this model might be, or when we might use it? Darren, um, could it work well for an organisation that isn't set up for delivery? You know, they don't have their own digital teams, and so don't have those skills in house. Um, you can contract with an external provider to do that um, yeah. and reduce yeah. perception that you might be reducing the risk that way. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you put you put in place some sort of contract for this for us, and you might go to open tender, or you might put it out to a framework or something like that. Um, and then the, the the supplier kind of manages the whole thing. You know, they build it, they run it, they handle support, and they might feed back information to uh, to the to, to the service uh, owner. Uh, anyone else think of any other cases where we might uh, we might use this model? Nick. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, all good. Um, I was wondering, does it work if you are, um, so if you have a real, you either don't have enough people to, to, to own the service or the service is a commodity, more of a commodity and not something you need to, to invest time in, so you can just buy it from somebody. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I had down commodity as well. So, um, it, it might be something as simple like device provision, you know, as a little service to to, the, to get devices delivered in the department, or it could be like an IT help desk where um, maybe the you know the commodity there is the knowledge about supporting a set of IT, or or maybe cloud hosting, you know, that again is another has has become a commodity over the past few years. Yeah. Um, I wonder. And I'm, I am kind of speculating a bit here now. And uh, as an agile practitioner, I'm a bit nervous about what I'm about to say. But I wonder if, you know, if you are a bit strapped for money or people to maintain a service, um, this is at least some way to kind of keep it alive uh, if the service isn't, isn't particularly fast changing, really. Uh, and I'm a bit nervous about that because, you, you know, we kind of know that services to continue to be successful need to be evolved that maybe you can put something into your contract that um, requires some sort of evolution uh, uh, even though you don't have your own team on it the, the other thing i was wondering was like what if the service isn't a kind of core part of what the organization is doing um, is that is that a case where you might actually outsource it in this way Uh, Darwin, is that a legacy hand? I have a new hand, I just thought of another situation. So um, some departments are going through a recruitment freeze at the moment, so you can't necessarily hire the people that you need to um, maintain the service or to run the service. So uh, sometimes it's easier to get budget to uh, outsource things than it is to bring in people. Yeah. Hire civil servants, sadly. Yeah. Not saying it's right, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah. yeah. Some, similar to not having people. Um, yeah. And the other example where you might use this is if uh, you've got some sort of legacy technology that is not a capability that you want to have in the department. So I think HMRC have some quite big contracts for services for maintaining some of their older systems where you need yeah. a special supplier. Yeah, that's a good shout, actually. Yeah. It does make sense in some cases. Yeah. So there are, you know, there are some suppliers that specialize in things like um, Microsoft Dynamics. So, you know, if you don't want to build a dynamics capability in-house, that, that might be this, the, the sort of thing you might outsource like this. And uh, is it Vasos, you've also mentioned, might be okay for a very small narrow scope service. Um, I think, the, I think the, like the rate of change is the thing that's, that's kind of interesting there for me. Um, what about the downsides? I kind of mentioned one there already. You know, if 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 the service is a is a kind of rapidly changing thing, or if you're in early phases where you're you're a bit unsure about what the service should actually do, you know, you might be in pre-discovery, discovery alpha, and maybe 
you know, maybe this isn't, maybe you just can't write a requirements document and a contract and hand it over to a supplier and manage it through a contract. Um, the other, some of the other downsides I've seen with this is sometimes there's data in the in the service that you just can't, you, you might want access to, but contractually you can't have access to it, um, which can be a bit frustrating really. So you're down to contract negotiation again and possibly paying more money to get data that that really sh should be yours, should be yours because it's about your service. Um, anything else? Um, I think that was it on that one. Okay, let's let's move on. So model two is a bit different. So in, in this model, uh, you've got an in-house team working in an agile way, and that that could still include some contractors in, in, with your your permanent staff. Um, but it's not outsourced in the same way. You know, they're kind of working to yours, to, to, to the team or to the, the client. Uh, but there's no service owner. And in this model, uh, responsibilities are split across other roles. So they might, they might have a product manager, a delivery manager, and a tech lead. And so um, they're, they're doing uh, all, all of the work of the service owner in addition to, you know, doing their, their other jobs. Any uh, any thoughts on like what the benefits of that might be or when you might use it? Well, I'll, I'll give you one for free then. You know, if if there isn't someone to be the service owner, uh, then you're just going to have to divide the work um, differently than that. Yeah, Dan says a small organization. Um, yeah, you might um, you might not have the budget or the headcount, uh, or you might not feel you need someone dedicated. You know, it could be a small service. You might not um, need to uh, have or have someone who's just doing service ownership, and the role might be divisible uh, across uh, those other roles. Um, I think the other thing is we talked about, uh, yeah, we talked about responsibilities earlier and like having a clear separation of responsibilities. And this, this seems to be me to be a case where you really need that. Um, uh, if you're dividing the, the roles across three or four different people, uh, it's important to know who's who's owning what, and that that kind of relies on them wanting to do, you know, s s take on some of that additional responsibility in addition to their day jobs and like having the time to do that. Um, yeah, Darren, also you mentioned a case where um, the org might be new to delivering services, so might not have anyone available. Um, we kind of, I was at DFE in 2017 and we, we didn't quite have that situation. There were a few people around, um, but yeah, they just, they were already quite busy uh, doing uh, service ownership on a bunch of services. And so we kind of had to bootstrap up uh, with other people doing it. And uh, as, as Deepak says, yeah, completing a racy or having some, you know, playing delegation poker or s some other kind of uh, division of accountabilities and responsibilities is, pr is pretty important. And I think it's important to kind of uh, not just do it at the start, but actually to keep an eye on it as the service, you know, grows or changes. Um, so what are, the, are there maybe some you know other than like the responsibilities maybe getting muddled is there any other kind of issues with this model do you think uh, Esther yeah, I suppose you probably covered it already, but it's around that um, people have different drivers. I suppose as a service owner, you want to be impartial and protect our end users and customers. Whereas as a del delivery manager, I might want to deliver something quick. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, there's something about that is it neutrality that comes with service ownership. Um, Eleanor, you've got a great point there about you know decisions not being made. If there's a really big decision that uh, that affects 
the entire service like who whose job is it um uh to do that and like will it just get, get kind of punted down the road um the other thing is um maybe it's unclear to people kind of above the service in the hierarchy yeah who's in charge as dan says who do i have to talk to you about a thing um with that kind of shared responsibility model darwin uh you had your hand up i think oh you just said what i was gonna say actually yeah. ah, okay I'm, I'm not a big fan of the term single ringable neck um but it is important that people know who to talk to <laughs> um I, and you, you could manage that you know and you could say well the, the delivery manager isn't responsible for everything but maybe they're the point of contact or the product manager isn't responsible for everything but maybe they are the point of contact um and then you know they they, they the, through that they might become like first among amongst equals i love that esther as well there's always somewhere to hide as well Sh surely surely not not my fault gov <laughs> Okay, um, we'll move on. I, so model three, uh, there is a service owner in this one and they've got a digital delivery team or a, or a service delivery team. Um, it's not outsourced, uh, but they don't include, they don't, um, they're not responsible for any non-digital aspects of the service. So say if letters go out or there's a call center or there's face-to-face -face or an assisted digital service, they're not, they're not responsible for that. And uh, they're definitely not responsible for the policy, and they don't they don't actually do the support for the service either. That's all kind of handled by a central support function. So um, we've got we've got some clear ownership of the digital stuff there, but it still might be a bit muddled uh, uh, with the you know for a user from a user's perspective. We've kind of um, we've kind of exposed our organisation design a bit there. And we, sh we should never do that, really. Um, any other, can we think of any other benefits of this model or, or any disbenefits? Darwin, again, thanks for That's all right. <laughs> the big risk, I think, is that you end up with a service that isn't joined up between your channels and it fragments um, and people f fall through the gaps between potentially between the digital service and the uh, non-digital parts of the service um, so that could be a real risk if you're not if it's not thought through and they're not working together really closely yeah so Louise and Ben you mentioned that in chat as well yes yeah. um, I there's some sort of alignment needed really especially from a user perspective and um that maybe you can do that with like some strong service design uh, that kind of works across these different channels um what about the relationship to policy here does anyone have any thoughts about that Dan. Feels to me like just another version of the number two option that you put up, but basically there are different people in charge of different parts and it's just a different way of managing those interactions and conversations. And it's probably going to be further apart and probably the chance for more kind of, oh God, what do we do type situations <laughs> yeah. um, happening there. So very similar to the one before, but slightly different <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah there's i mean i've i've seen this work and i've seen it not work and it depends a bit on the relationship between the service owner and whoever's leading on on the policy really and if they if they can work pretty closely and if there's some sort of feedback loop from policy uh, sorry from digital uh, delivery back to policy um then that that can be quite effective um it, there is that there is that kind of separation between policy and digital delivery and that um you know maybe maybe isn't the best thing 
but it, I, I have seen it work. What about um, what about separating out like support for the service? So if a user's got a problem, they they're actually contacting a different team from the team that owns the digital delivery. Uh, Esther. Yeah, I think you just want, to, well, I as a user would want to phone one person and get the answer. I don't care whether it's a digital issue or a policy issue. I want to be able to phone a person. Yeah. Yeah. And anyone else got any reflections on that one? In my experience, separating the support kind of starves you of a useful feedback mechanism and of things you can do to improve your service or where users aren't getting the service they need. So having that, it can be really quick, um, good channel for, for the team. And if they see that, if they're having to support something and the same issues are coming up, that gives them a real incentive to resolve those things as well, because it yeah. takes pain away from the team. Yeah, uh, David Mayaki. Yeah, I'd say uh, more comprehensive knowledge articles are created. So um, there's that gap is filled between the digital and the non-digital aspects, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there's something, I think if, I've seen this model uh, where support is centralized and that's often done for efficiency uh, of the, the organization. So they kind of, they, 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 all the, a lot of services are supported by the same group of people, but they maybe don't have the detailed knowledge of a service that the, the service team has. And um, they might not have the same incentives uh, as the service team. So there could be a bit of, bit of misalignment there. Um, so yeah, it can, can work. It depends a bit on this balance of efficiency and effectiveness really. Let's move on. Uh, okay, model four. Uh, so we've now in, we're now incorporating the digital support into the digital delivery team. So um, the the digital delivery team and the service owner can get that feedback that Darwin was talking about, and there's alignment between the people supporting the service and delivering the service, and it, it might be some of the same people uh, doing both. Um, but we still haven't included the non-digital aspects of service or, uh, or any policy. So we still have some of the some of the problems from that side. Um, uh, some of the other benefits of this one is uh, what I've seen before is that people can transition from support into into digital delivery. They're not uh, they kind of can be upskilled because they're working so closely with the digital delivery team. And uh, I've seen a few people do that and end up doing, uh, like for example, software development. Um, but it, it, it may be less efficient for the organization to have these di different digital delivery teams having, having their own support. So one other kind of model I've seen work is that the digital team keeps the digital support close to it while it's in the early stages of delivery. So while you're in your, your private betas. And then as the service becomes more stable, more predictable, uh, you can kind of embed people from the central digital, uh, sorry, you can embed people from the central support function into the digital team for a few weeks. They can pick up more knowledge about the product and then they can go back into their central support team and run support for the service from there. So that gives you, um, it gives them the knowledge needed to support the service effectively. And it gives that, uh, that efficiency that organizations are often, often looking for. Um, the other downside of this, uh, of embedding digital support into the digital delivery team is it can, it can make the team look a bit more expensive uh, because you've got those extra people in there. Um, and if you're particularly keen on your central support function, that could be an argument against having it embedded like that. Sorry, someone's trying to ring me. I'm going to decline that. Um, Model five, uh, what we've done here is we've added comms and engagement into the, the remit of the service owner. So what we have in this model is we've got a service that's discretionary. 
So people don't have to use it, but government would like them to use it. So we've added comms and engagement uh, into that uh, service owner remit. Any, has anyone seen anything like this? Or uh, got any thoughts about this model? Because quite often these functions are, are centralized. No, okay. Um, I think I think like like bringing support in, bringing comms and engagement in um, helps them uh, build knowledge of the service, and that helps them be more effective in their in their comms and engagement work. Um, the other thing I've seen with uh, comms working is it's often quite waterfall, and so there can be a bit of a mismatch in terms of how a comms team might work with a digital delivery team, particularly if they're an agile, uh, agile delivery team. And so there can be a bit of a culture clash there, but it's, it's, not, in, it's not insurmountable. Um, the other thing that might happen, you know, very occasionally, there, is, there are kind of pauses in comms and engagement activity across government. And so uh, that can leave these people left with, with very little to do in respect of the service, really, which can be a bit frustrating. I'll move on. Okay, so six is maybe a bit more interesting the past couple of examples, because what we're doing here is you've got your digital team, you've got your service support, uh, but what you're doing is you're bringing in some of the policy aspects of the uh, service under control of the service owner. Uh, and by low level aspects, I mean, particularly policy that's close to what's happening in the service. So it could be, um, it could be to do with terminology. You know, you might have control over that if that's in the policy. Uh, it could be limits. Or say, say you've got a, a service that's about applying for stuff. It could be limits on the number of applications you can make. Um, it could be limits on application dates. So not, not kind of high level policy, like we will build a service in this area, more uh, stuff that's kind of finer tuning policy around how the service actually works. Uh, has, anyone, has anyone seen this where the service owner is responsible for, uh, for these kind of lower level aspects of policy? Um, is, it, is it Venetia? Is that how you say your name? Sorry. Yes, there's hi. Hi there. Um, you say, is it this one you think looks like a great model? Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah. I think that would work nicely. Yeah. If you can get it working. Yeah. Um, what do you think uh, some of the reasons might be for not, for not getting it working? It would be quite big. It depends on, it depends on the proposition um, mm. and how big it is. Yeah. But if it was quite neat, it would work perfectly. Yeah. Eleanor, you're uh, you're equally enthusiastic, or more so. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking there. It's it's the whole thing about not having the policy dumped on you and having to deliver to it if you're actually um, you have some ownership of the of aspects of that policy. It, yeah. It's got to be a a good thing. Yeah. I I think so, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say why I think so as well. Uh, ben, you you say it's a major restructure. Tell us more about that. It's just an answer to the question why why do we think this might not be implemented? Yeah. So, um, you know, big org redesign essentially. I think for probably most of the organisations that that we work in. Yeah, yeah. I've so I've I've seen it in a couple of departments now, and um. I know some DFE people were signed up. I first saw it at DFE. Actually, no, I first saw it at the Skills Funding Agency in 2016. And then that was merged with the Education Funding Agency. And then they were both folded into DFE. So I've seen it at DFE. And what they have is um, they have a role called policy designer, where it's someone who's got a policy background, but they're embedded into a, a digital or a service delivery team. And they are responsible for for some aspects of the policy, and um, it, it seems to work. And so, I, 
I'll say more about that. So I, when I worked on future farming at DEFRA, we introduced a similar model working with Janet Hughes there where um, it, it, it wasn't a major restructure. It was a bit of a restructure in that um, people who were working in policy, um, they, their line management stayed in policy, but their, their kind of their day to day, they were working as part of a digital delivery team really. And they were kind of acting as a policy product owner I think that's what we called them there. So very similar to policy designer in terms of their uh, responsibilities. And um, has anyone heard of the one team gov approach? This was something that came out about um, six, five, six years ago as a result of that early work at the skills funding agency where policy and delivery worked, worked in the same team. So um, yeah. What, what if the policy is really big? You know, you might, you might, you might struggle there, and you might have to have your your the policy owned elsewhere. Or if it needs to dovetail with a lot of other policy teams, that that might not work. Um, the other thing I've seen is not not every policy person wants to be embedded in a in a digital delivery team. Um, it, it, it you know it's a different way of working, and I've. I guess I've seen about one in 10 policy people have, have not enjoyed the experience of working in a digital delivery team. Uh, Darwin. I was just going to say an example of where I've seen this work well was with um, Department of Health and Social Care, where we're working on a service called Healthy Start. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the policy folks who were um, looking to digitise the service, so they were new to digital. Um, but right back in the discovery phase, through the research we found, some opportunities to uh, reduce dropouts when people went from being pregnant to having had their baby. Uh, they had to reapply at that point, which is obviously a really stressful time to do that. Yeah. Um, and through the re research we showed and the desk research, we showed them that this was really unhelpful. And because they had the ownership of the policy, they were able to take that directly and, and change the policy so that people didn't have to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so great. it can be really beneficial. Yeah, great. I think there's something about um, there's something here about faster feedback loops. Really, if the policy and the delivery and the operational people are kind of sitting together, so that that was the other thing we we tried at Future Farming was we brought in people from the operational uh, side of Defra from mainly from the rural payments agency, and we had uh, them as part of the delivery team. You know, we didn't say it was a digital team; it was a delivery team. With policy delivery and operations working together, you know, having having daily stand-ups, you know, planning a joint roadmap, um, doing user research together, and I think uh, I think it's particularly beneficial in those early days when you are trying to, you know, you're still trying to figure out some aspects of the policy, uh, and you're doing that through delivery. Um, so it it can you know it can help upskill policy people in delivery and operational aspects. It can help upskill digital people in policy aspects, uh, similarly for operational people. So I think uh, um, it, it's great from that kind of we talk about multidisciplinary teams. This is kind of taking it to the next level, really. And I think there's something about uh, accountability as well. You know, if you're developing a policy. Uh, there's something about having a bit more accountability when you're working directly with the delivery of that policy than if you've just you've just kind of handed it off to another team to, to deliver really. Um, anything else? Uh, is that a legacy hand, Darren? Oh yes, it's right. That's all right. <laughs> all right, let's move on. I'll lay. Uh, I've. Uh, as I said at the start, I'm going to sh share the slides around and I've got a few links at the end, uh, a couple of which describe that my way of working. Um, I think we've got about five minutes left. We've got three more models. I'm going to try and pick uh, the two more interesting ones. OK, this one's interesting to me at least. <laughs> so <laughs> let's discuss that. So very similar to the last one, uh, but in this case, the, the service owner also has an enabling team. And what, what, I, what I mean by an enabling team is a, t is a team that looks after something like recruitment, finance, procurement. Um, they, might, they might have like a small project management office where they're looking after high level plans, 
um, they might uh, that enabling team might be supporting governance. You know, they might run a governance board. Uh, and they might be managing all the reporting on behalf of the service owner. So I think of it as a small team looking after, you know, finance, procurement, hiring, etc. Nick GDS. Sorry, I actually Nick. pressed that by accident. Sorry. That's all right, mate. I thought you were going to you were going to tell us how it was all done at GDS. No, I'm trying to. No, you carry on. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out if I recognise that. Yeah, and we definitely don't get it all right. Hundred yeah. percent. So we did. Um, so we did have this a bit at GDS, uh, where um, you, I don't know if you remember the enabling strategy back in 2014-15, the, the kind of pre-gap thing. Um, there was a little enabling team that kind of sat and serviced a bunch of teams doing. Uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna characterize it as discovery and alpha type work onto different uh, platforms. And uh, Ash Stevens ran a little enabling the team there that looked after all the reporting. I did managed all the procurement and finances on behalf of a bunch of service owners uh, doing work across that area. Um, so why is it why is it useful? Why do I think it's useful? Um, I think it's useful because it, it often takes a lot of load off the delivery managers. <laughs> Basically, because you know procurement and financial management, I don't. I, I'm I'm of the delivery management school where I don't see those as kind of core delivery manager responsibilities. Um, I, you know, delivery managers it, for me is about in you know in helping the team form, you know, helping the team work well and unblocking. And if they're spending all their time doing procurement, uh, managing finances, and doing reporting upwards, they can't spend all their time on that good stuff. And uh, in the absence of an enabling team, what you often find is uh, you often find people being served by business partners, you know, the finance business partner, the commercial business partner, the HR business partner. And they, uh, in many departments, they won't do the finance, the HR and the commercial. They're there to kind of advise you and assure you and kind of guide you a bit but they won't do the legwork on those. So having a small enabling team like that can, can take a lot of work off the delivery managers. Um, but, uh, and there is a but, obviously it's, it's more people, so it, it can be more expensive. You need a particular, you know, your service needs to be at a particular scale to be able to justify having a bunch of people doing that sort of stuff. You know, you have to be doing a, a lot of procurement, hiring, a lot of spend and day-to-day -day financial management to justify it. Um, people in that area, they might be pulled between the service and the central function. And the central function might want to do things differently. Say a central commercial might want to do a commercial differently to the way your service owner wants to do it. So there can be a bit of tension there. And it looks, you know, if you're a, if you're a head of an enabling function, like head of finance, it looks inefficient to have all these people kind of spread around as opposed to having a shared finance service, essentially. Um, so I would only do this if, um, if I do it in bigger, you know, bigger services, but I'd only do it if you need those people to kind of act as a bridge between your kind of a digital agile world and your uh, more established, probably waterfall, commercial finance and HR ways of working. And you might not have that at GDS. Everyone else has got it. <laughs> I assert. Uh, Nick. Yeah, we do uh, have a version of this at GDS. Um, I think what's interesting is uh, I think you're right, and I've got so many thoughts about this. Um, you, you need that the teams that the enabling team deal with to also, um, and this is actually something that we're struggling with at the moment work in a way that um, is kind of outcome focused um, so that they can, because digital teams tend to work in an outcome focused way as well, otherwise you get that misalignment. And it, there's also probably space here to mention Emily's Agile Onion, Team Onion, sorry, I think she dropped the A word, but yeah, the Team Onion stuff, because that helps too. Yeah, exactly. So um, I can't remember the URL, but look out for Team Onion from Emily Weber, uh, formerly of this parish or that parish. Um, 
I think the, the other thing is like, if you have an enabling team that's kind of embedded with your delivery teams, um, they can pick up some of the agile goodness as well. So I've worked with some enabling teams to help them do things like run retrospectives. I've helped some enabling teams do co-design where they sit down with the digital delivery teams and say, okay, what would a good process for procurement look like for you? Um, what would a good process for hiring or for managing uh, spend look like for you? And uh, thanks Dan for that link in the chat, by the way. So um, that helps everyone uh, do things more efficiently and more effectively when they're working together to co-design those processes. Um, I, I'm gonna skip over, I will, I'll briefly show them to, to tease you, then you can do, do, the, do them in your own uh, time. So model eight was, uh, as for seven, but the service is so big, the service owner has to delegate segments of the end-to-end -end journey to deputy service owners. And we spoke a bit before about alignment in silos. Uh, I'll give you a bit of a clue there. Uh, model nine uh, introduces a model office where um, there's a unit within the big, a big service that is looking at upcoming changes to policy, delivery and operations, and is either trying to simulate the impact of those or test against a copy of the production service or otherwise evaluate the impact of those changes. And that can help you, um, it can help you catch things like a change in policy having a significant impact on operations. Um, so that's a useful thing to have in a bigger service. Uh, that is it from me. I think we're out of time for final thoughts, but um, thanks for engaging. Uh, we've got the recording. Uh, I'm on that email. I'm still currently on Twitter as well, at Mark Delgano. And uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, if anybody has any feedback or ideas or want to contribute to future sessions, just get in touch with us. Uh, I, we've got plenty of these going in the diaries over the coming months and plenty of opportunity for us to learn more things. So enjoy the rest of your afternoons, enjoy your weekends, and we'll speak to you all again soon. Thank all right. You. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.